patient, merciful, kind, long suffering. We come before you tonight and we are so grateful for life. And the life that you offer, which is the life more abundantly. And so, Lord, as we come, we pray for forgiveness of sins. We pray for an open mind. We pray for a heart that is soft to your words. So, Lord, refresh us from your throne. In Jesus' name. This time we're going to jump right into our questions. Sometimes is a perspective. Because the Bible says that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and those who are called according to his purpose. So the first thing I would encourage a person to understand is that it's not, you know, we have to look at that thing that we call bad in the right light. Sometimes God allows things, you know, to happen that appears really bad, but it works out for our good. So that's one of the first things that I would recommend. I'm, I'm a living example of that. I thought in 2016 when I had to have heart surgery that that was the worst thing that ever came to my life. And just to imagine that when people ask me what's one of the best things that's ever happened in your life, I say open heart surgery. You know, and the reason why is because I learned life-changing lessons from the Lord that I would not have learned had I not gone through that crisis. Truly, I'm a living witness that all things work together for good. It looks so bad, but it turned out to be one of my greatest blessings. So that's the first thing I would do is redirect that thought and to help them understand even things that we call bad work out for blessings for the child of God. But number two, the Bible makes it very clear that as a result of all things working together for good for the children of God, Sometimes things can be bad in its initiation, but in the end, it works out for greater blessings. And so it is, I think of a man that I got to know personally. Um, he wrote a book that is sold in many bookstores, including the bookstores that are owned by Seventh-day Adventists. His name is Noble, or was, Noble Alexander. He wrote a book called, I Will Die Free. And in that book, I had the privilege of meeting uh, Noble Alexander, talking with him, and just picking his brain. You know, he went to prison unlawfully. I mean, they, they did him so wrong. But when he went to prison, he was able to minister to so many people and to bring the light of the knowledge of God to a group of men that never heard of God before. It's kind of like Joseph. You know, Joseph's brothers did bad things to him. And Joseph was a good guy. But do you know what Joseph said in the end in Genesis 45? And verse 5, Joseph said, God allowed these things to happen, that eventually I'd be put in the position to preserve life, even yours. And so God allows, he doesn't ordain bad things to happen to his people, but God allows things to happen to us that sometimes appears bad, but it's not really bad. But then there are some things that are truly bad, but it always works together for good. And so we serve a wonderful Savior that the Bible says in Psalms 145 and verse 17, it says, all the Lord's ways are righteous. And so we must learn to trust Him. And God allows even bad things to happen in His people's lives so that it will work to a greater good in the end. May we be faithful. Amen. Right. And to teach us a lesson. Sure. How was God born? How was God born? You know, the Bible says in Isaiah 45, uh, it says in Isaiah 45, 
Let's see if I can remember exactly what that verse is. Isaiah 45, I think it's verse 10, right around there. And, oh no, verse 6 really. Well, you can take it down. It says in Isaiah 45, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. God, there is no one that has made him God does not have a beginning. God does not have an end. He is the beginning of all creation. In other words, he's the one that begins creation, but God himself has no beginning. That's why he's called the everlasting God. And so the reality is that God was not born. Now, if we're talking about Jesus, God in the flesh, when Jesus was born in the flesh, uh, we don't have an exact date, but one date I can guarantee you that it's not is December 25th. So if by chance you're talking about Jesus and you're asking when was Jesus born as a man, as a man then we definitely don't know. No one knows the date that he was born. In paganism, there was a belief that a man named Nimrod, the Bible refers to him as a mighty hunter against the Lord. And Nimrod, when he died, Paganism, or pagans in his day believed that his spirit ascended up into the sun. And as a result of that, the sun was known in the, in the worship of constellations. The sun was to be the worship, the people who worshiped the sun was worshiping the chief god. But it was believed that Nimrod had a wife by the name of Isis. And it was believed that Nimrod impregnated Isis kind of miraculously. And Isis had a son named Tammuz. And Tammuz was born December 25th. Tammuz is actually spoken about in the Bible in a negative way. It was in Ezekiel chapter 8. And God's people began to offer these cakes unto Tammuz to worship Tammuz. And God was very offended by that. But it was believed that Nimrod miraculously impregnated Isis, who eventually had a child by the name of Tammuz. And if Nimrod is the chief god then Tammuz would be the son of God. And Tammuz was born on December 25. And so the idea of, of what we call today Christmas as far as December 25th, the birth of the Son of God, it actually came from paganism, the worship of idols and things, something bad. But what do we do around Christmas? Well, what I do around Christmas, and I would encourage you to do the same, is while I know that Jesus was not born on December 25th, no one knows when Jesus was born. But what I do know is that people really are thinking about Jesus on December 25th. And so what I do is I take full advantage of that. And so on that Christmas season, I gladly go from house to house and I gladly talk about the birth of Jesus Christ to people who probably would never want to talk about it otherwise. And we reason together and learn about God and certainly we follow him. So we don't know when Jesus was born. He wasn't born December 25th. But when December 25th comes, we can definitely spend some time worshiping God, thanking God that Jesus was born, and certainly making it known to a lot of people who don't know. All right, thank you. Is it okay to look at SDA memes? Memes. SDA memes. Um, you know, yeah, not a problem. Not a problem. SDA memes, it's all right. Um, when you think about the memes, uh, memes are usually used to make jokes, okay? Memes are usually used to make some type of joke or, you know, make light of something. Um, when you think about what God has given to this movement to give to the world, the Bible presents the last gospel message to go to the world as a very deep and very solemn message. Last night, we learned we're living in a time of judgment. And uh, God is making final decisions, and yours and my cooperation with the Lord will determine what decision God is going to make in the end. Well, to me, that says that's a pretty solemn and serious time. So the last thing I want to do is present any jokes or anything that would make light of such a very serious and solemn time, a serious and solemn message. And so I'm sure people innocently do memes of all these different things to make fun and make laughter and all these things, but I definitely would recommend never take the things of God, you know, and try to use it lightly. This is one of the contexts of thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. God does not want you to take his name 
and use it casually in everyday life. God doesn't want you to start saying, oh God, for any reason. That should be something said when we are worshiping Him and taking Him very seriously. And so because of that, let us not take the things that are serious and very solemn and have very deep meaning. Let us not take these things and make jokes about them. I wouldn't recommend that at all. God would be very offended. Since Jesus is coming soon, would I, uh, should I worry about having a girlfriend? Since Jesus is coming soon, should I worry about having a girlfriend? You know, there's a lot of ways I can answer this question. <laughs> um, you know, the first thing is, is that if you are under the age of 20, you should not even be thinking about a girlfriend. Um, the reason for that is the maturity that is needed for a young man to consider a spouse typically does not even develop well until after they reach their 20s. And so while a young person is still in their teens, there's still a lot of development that's taking place emotionally, as well as mentally, and even to certain degrees, physically. And so because of that, I would highly discourage a young man from thinking about a girlfriend if he's not even out of his teens. I would say, why don't you focus on developing yourself and keeping yourself focused? The second thing is, a young man, uh, when you have a girlfriend, the only reason that you have a girlfriend is so that you can prepare for potentially marriage. You don't find a girl to just experiment with her and just see, let's see how it all goes. In friendship with a young lady, you should already be able to observe qualities in that person that you can say, she seems like she would make a good wife. And then after friendship, then you can now enter into something called courtship. And the way that the Bible teaches courtship is that God believes in, God is the one, the Father, He's the one that actually helps choose the spouse. So how does that work out on earth? The, well, the way that works out on earth is that, I don't know if you ever paid attention to the issues in Genesis 6, where it talks about these sons of God and daughters of men and how they came together. You know the first mistake that the sons of God made in Genesis 6? It says, they saw a whole bunch of women that they thought were real pretty, and it says, and they found the ones that they chose. I don't know if anybody ever caught those two words, they chose. A young man does not choose the woman. The Bible order was that the parents chooses the woman. And the parent would tell the young man, we think that this person would be very good for you as a spouse. And then that young man could pray about it, and then if he's in agreement with it, then he goes into a courtship. What I'm sharing with you is something that probably 95% of the time is not practiced. And that's why I probably sound like a really weird brother to you right now. But I am so grateful that I have a 21-year-old. And two years ago, when he was 19, my 21-year-old son said, Mom and Dad, I have learned to trust your judgment so much that my son Jared said, would you please choose my spouse for me? And we said, son, we would gladly do that. And we are thankful to God that he has touched your heart, that he would allow, uh, that he would touch you to agree. Because I can guarantee you this, I've been in marriage now for 22 years. For me, that's a long time. And I've learned a lot. And I love my son. There is no way in the world that I'm going to set my son up with some woman just so he can have his heart broken in the end. So there's a lot of wisdom in allowing the parent to choose the girlfriend that eventually would become, hopefully, your wife. Godly parents. Very important. And so it is that when you say, Should, Jesus is coming soon, marriage is not an issue. A spouse is called to be a help meet. Well, what are you helping me meet? The requirements of God. My spouse is to help me as a man meet the requirements of God. My job to help my wife meet the requirements that God has set for her. So marriage in godly context is beautiful because we're helping each other remain faithful to God. So there's nothing wrong with marriage in the last days as we see the Lord approaching. The problem is most wives discourage their husbands. 
Most husbands discourage their wives. So instead of them helping each other meet the standards God has set, we are helping each other tear down the standards that God has set for our lives. And this is why a little statement that I always think about, it says, not one in 100 marriages results happily. That's a very uh, profound and, I know, inspired statement. Not one in 100 marriages. That means that if there's 100 marriage, married people in this room, only one marriage is happy. The other 99 are going through some pretty bad stuff. Why? Because most of us entered marriage wrong. And so what I'm presenting is the ideal of what God shares. So nothing wrong with getting married in the last days, but you have to have the right motives, and you've got to do it God's way. And you'll be very blessed. All right? Okay. Thank you. Keep putting your questions in the box. Answer them. Thanks, Amen. Amen. Please all stand up so we can sing our theme song, Troublesome Times. Jesus is coming soon. Should I look for the link that says church, or should I look for a link that says Mission Hope Seventh-day Adventist Church? Church. Oh, Mission, Mission Hope. Mission. Mission Hope is asking for a password. Try church. It usually populates one. All right. Yeah. Are we going to have a password, Brother Esnecki? I'm not going to use 
I want to invite us to turn our Bibles to the book of Revelation, the 14th chapter. It is in Revelation, the 14th chapter, that we find the last gospel message to be given to the world before the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I want you to see what the Bible says. In Revelation, we're looking at the 14th chapter, and we are now going to consider the 6th verse. In Revelation 14, 6, now I am reading and quoting from a King James Version, and it says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell upon the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. Now, when this was given, this is what we call the first angel's message. In the first angel's message, we see that a time of judgment is come. It's here. It's not that we're looking forward to it. It's here now. We have gone through several nights of studying the gospel through the sanctuary. And as a result of going through the gospel through the sanctuary, we saw that there is a sanctuary in heaven, a holy place and a most holy place. And there was significance because in the courtyard, Jesus represented the lamb that died. In the holy place, he represented the priest that lives and intercedes. It was in the most holy place that Christ becomes our high priest and judge. And judgment is designed to make final decisions, whether we will be cleansed from all sin for good or cut off from God for good. It's a close of probation. And that's why Revelation 22, 11 says, a time will come where God will say, let him who is filthy be filthy still. They never get unfilthy after that. There's going to be a group of people that God is going to say, let him who is holy be holy still. And they will never be filthy ever again. God is going to have a sealed, settled people. This time of judgment we now see has arrived since the year 1844 that Jesus moved from the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary into the most holy place to begin that very serious and solemn work of judgment, making final decisions. And so last night we made an appeal. And last night our appeal was very serious. We talked about how many people have been playing games with God, not allowing God to have that sanctifying effect upon our hearts and helping us to cooperate with him in the putting away of sin from our lives. And as we were doing that, many of us stood up realizing, Lord, I have not been taking you seriously. I have not fully submitted myself to the gospel. Well, last night was a glorious night because those who realized that took their stand and made an open and public statement. I'm going all the way with Jesus. I'm going to cooperate with him fully. No longer my will, truly his will be done. If he wants me to forgive, I will forgive. If he wants me to forbear, I will forbear. If he wants me to hang in there a little longer, I will do it. If he wants me to cut some things off, I'll cut it off. If he wants me to cut some things on, I'll cut it on. Whatever he wants is what I will do. Well, I must let you know that it's verse 8 of Revelation 14 that now becomes very relevant to us. Because in verse 8 of the second angel's message, 
it says, And there followed another angel, saying, What? Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. It is by the grace of God that this evening we need to understand who is this Babylon. And the reason we need to understand it is because the Bible speaks very negatively about this system. This system is completely against God. And there's a reason we know this to be so, because when you think about it, it talked about Babylon and how it distributed this wine that caused fornication. In other words, because of Babylon's wine, many people who were once faithful to God would start committing spiritual fornication. They would start turning away from God and finding other lovers. They would turn away their love from the one and only God, and they would begin to go ahead and mess around with a whole bunch of other lovers rather than God. And it was for this reason that God puts a condemnation out to Babylon. To the point, go to Revelation 18. In Revelation 18, this message is also to be given in the last days. And you will find that it's a repetition of the very things that was stated about Babylon in Revelation 14. But in Revelation 18, now there's even some more. In Revelation, the 18th chapter, we're going to consider verses 1 to 5. And you're about to see that Babylon is a very offensive system to God. And look at how the Bible gives a description of this system. In Revelation 18, starting at verse 1, it says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen and has become the habitation of what? Devils. And has become the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Now watch verse 4. What does God have to say about this system called Babylon? In verse 4 it says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. That means that God has people in a place that has become the hold of every foul spirit, the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. God has people in a place that is filled with devilish and demonic behavior. So God says in verse 4, Come out of her, my people. Why? Let's finish the verse. That you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. So God finds this place called Babylon to be a place that is terribly offensive to him. It is terribly offensive to his people. And God in love, seeing that he has people there, he doesn't condemn the people, he just simply tells them, come out of this system, because this system is about to receive judgment. Well, one of the major figures that was in there was wine. Babylon was giving wine. Now, this wine is not something in a literal sense. But I want to show you something that wine does do, literally. Go to the book of Proverbs 31. In Proverbs 31, I want you to see what wine does literally. Because what wine does to us in a literal sense, spiritual wine does the same. I want you to watch this. What wine does to us in a literal sense, spiritual wine does the same. And so it is that when we look at Proverbs 31, verses 4 and 5, I want you to see what literal wine does because you're going to see what it does to God's people spiritually as well. In Proverbs 31, starting at verse 4, if you're there, please say amen. amen. The Bible says in Proverbs 31 and verse 4, It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor princes strong drink. 
lest they drink and something will happen. What will happen? They will forget the law and they will do something else. And they will pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. God knew that when we drink wine, don't we forget the law? If you drink a lot of alcohol, you get drunk. And when you get drunk, isn't it easy to run past the red light? You should have stopped that. Isn't it easy to not really think that what I'm inclined to do to steal is not the best thing? When you drink wine, it affects your mind. And it makes you do things that are very bad, including forgetting the law. As it is true in a literal sense, and this is why Christians should not drink alcohol. Amen? Amen. So it is, in a spiritual sense, God says, I don't want you drinking this wine of Babylon, because this wine does the same thing. So what is it that helps us understand what this wine is? In Matthew 16 and verse 6, Jesus used a word that is synonymous to wine. In other words, when you think of what alcohol is, when you look at alcohol, especially if you're dealing with wine, you know, if I was dealing with beer, I'd talk about wheat. But if I'm dealing with wine, I'm often talking about grapes. If you're dealing with wine, you first have a fresh grape. But then after the grape begins to decompose and it begins to rot, then after that, that grape starts to build up this thing called acidic acid. It starts to build this up. And as a result of that, the grape starts going through something called fermentation. And when the grape goes through the fermentation, that's ultimately how it breaks down to produce what we know today as wine. Well, Jesus said, then Jesus said unto them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. One day Jesus warned the people about beware of this leaven. Well, what really is leaven? The word leaven means ferment. So leaven is something that's fermented, just like wine. So wine and leaven, they go very well together. They're basically a fermented product. Well, what was this fermentation that was coming from the Pharisees and the Sadducees that Jesus said, beware of it? Well, the Bible says this. It says, then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, in other words, literal, but it says, but of the what? Doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. So in other words, there are teachings, that's what a doctrine is, a teaching. There are teachings that can come from a person that are erroneous, wrong, foul, perverted that God likens it, religious teachings that come from people supposedly representing God, that God says, I liken that unto a fermented product, whether it be leaven or whether it be wine. And therefore, in the meantime, the Bible says two things. I want you to watch what the fermentation of the Pharisees did. It says... In the meantime, when they were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So the two spiritual dangers that are connected with this fermented teachings that was coming from the Pharisees and the Sadducees was one, false doctrine, Two, hypocrisy. These were things in a spiritual sense. So when you think about what does wine, which is a fermented product as well, what does wine represent? What does leaven, these fermented products, what do they represent in a spiritual sense? They represent false doctrine and hypocrisy. This is what Jesus warned. Not merely from Babylon, but even from amongst leaders in his own church at a certain time in history. Jesus says, beware of the fermentation of the leaders. False doctrine, hypocrisy. The reason why this is important is because when we study Mystery Babylon the Great, you will discover that there were several issues that God had with Babylon. Number one... It's in a double fallen condition. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. 
that great city. Number two, she made all nations drink wine. She made all nations partake of something fermented. In a spiritual sense, false doctrine and hypocrisy. Number three, their, their false doctrines and their hypocrisy was an expression of her hatred towards God. That's what the Bible says, the wrath that Babylon had. It had an anger and a hatred towards God. Why did Babylon present to the people false doctrine and hypocrisy? It did it because of its angry hatred towards God. In addition to that, it caused all nations to break their loyalty to him because they committed fornication. When a husband commits fornication out of his marriage or a wife, that is considered adultery. You're disloyal to the one whom you pledge to love. And so it is that this is the reason why God tells his people, come out of her. It's in a double fallen condition. Now, when something is double fallen, it doesn't get back up. In addition to that, she made all nations drink of this fermentation, which was none other than false doctrine and hypocrisy. The reason she did that was because she hates God and wanted to hurt God. And it caused all nations, all people, to break their loyalty to God. It is not a wonder that God would say, come out of her, my people. Wouldn't you agree it makes sense that if God saw his people in any type of system like this, is it not wise of God to say, come out of that? Doesn't that make sense? Absolutely. And so, we need to identify who this power is. Now, the reality is, is that we need to understand this is not a literal location as it relates to a nation. You know, when we think about Babylon historically, it was a nation. It was a particular place in the Middle East. But not so today. The reason why is simple. The Bible says in Isaiah 13, 19 and 20, and Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees, excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited. Neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there. Neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. So God made a prophecy that you and I have the opportunity, if you wanted to, to try to prove him wrong. And many people have. God promised prophetically in his word that Babylon, as far as the literal location, God says it will never be inhabited ever again. All mankind had to do to show that the God of the Bible is false. I mean, I would, I would offer this, I imagine maybe somebody did. I would just offer the atheists to say, hey, you want to get all Christians to stop following God? Well, prove God wrong. And one of the easiest ways to prove God wrong is very simple. God says the literal location of Babylon will be made desolate and it will never be inhabited by people ever again. It, nobody will ever live there anymore. All you got to do is get a group of people to go back to Babylon and go ahead and reestablish it. Go ahead and inhabit it. God is wrong. Take your Bibles and throw it in the trash. It would be that simple. Now, what you need to know is... Many people all over the world have tried to rebuild Babylon. You probably remember a man not too long ago. He's one of the reasons why we still have troopers overseas. You'll remember that it was George W. Bush that made it clear we need to go after Afghan, Afghan, we need to go over to the Middle East and we need to go to war because there's some nuclear bombs and all these things. And, you know, we still haven't found those nuclear bombs. But nevertheless, you'll remember that. These statements were made, and we went to war. And there was a man in particular in the Middle East at that time that was the leader of the nation of which we went to war with, the war with Iraq and so on, and, and, and you know Afghanistan, etc. Saddam Hussein. Do you know Saddam Hussein, one of the things he wanted to do was repopulate Babylon? It was his mission to repopulate Babylon, to prove that Babylon can once again be, be re-inhabited. I wonder how he did it. So when we take a look at this little note here, CNN, pretty reputable organization, everybody knows CNN. Well, here it is that they said, bringing Babylon back from the dead, April 4th, just a few years ago. Well, what did they find out? 
It says, Babylon was one of the glories of the ancient world. Its walls and mythic hanging gardens listed among the seven wonders. But following years of plunder, neglect, and conflict, the Babylon of today scarcely conjures that illustrious history. It says, in recent years, the Iraqi authorities have reopened Babylon to tourists, hoping that one day the site will draw visitors from all over the globe. Look at the close of the statement. But despite the site's remarkable archaeological value and impressive views, it is drawing only a smattering of tourists, drawn by a curious mix of ancient and more recent history. At best, all they could do today is get a few tourists to just pass by where Babylon was, and they come and look and go, huh, that's nice, and then they just leave. So literally to date, I looked from 2013 up to 2019, nothing has changed. Babylon to date is still a place uninhabited, just like the Bible says. So you know what that means? That means that we cannot take Revelation 14.8 literally. We can't. Revelation 14.8 must be a spiritual Babylon. It has to be. Because we just established the fact that the literal Babylon will never be inhabited ever again. That was in Isaiah 13. God made that too clear to miss it. So now we know that Babylon that we're dealing with, this great power that's rising up against God and causing people to turn away from God and be disloyal to Him, we know for sure Babylon is a spiritual condition. It is a spiritual place. It is not a literal location. If you understand what I'm saying thus far, let me hear you say amen. amen. All right, good. Now, let's go ahead and progress in our study. When we think about Babylon, it's symbolized in the book of Revelation in chapter 17. I want you to watch what God calls Babylon because we're about to unfold this thing even more. In Revelation, the 17th chapter, that's so sad. Well, go to Revelation 17. Let's take a look once again. In Revelation, the 17th chapter, let's go ahead and take a look at verse 1 and then 3 to 5. Because the screen is not going to help us with that tonight, by the way it's looking. So in Revelation 17, take a look at verse 1. It says, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great what? Whore. Of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Please keep in mind that there's something that God likens to a harlot, a prostitute. It's being called a whore. Now let's go ahead and find out who is this whore, verses 3 to 5. It says in verse 3, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Now watch verse 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, which said what? Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So notice that God really hates this thing called Babylon. He's now not only referring to it as that which hates him, that which is misleading his people, causing disloyalty, but it also is talking about how Babylon is a whore. It's a harlot. It's like a prostitute. And so it is that Babylon is definitely a place of massive offense to God. Yet, it is not a literal nation as we would look at it today. So we need to find out where this Babylon is, what it is, and what is going on with it. And if God's people are in it, I think we should help God's people get out of it. So let's continue. You'll notice that it referred to God's it, it, when God referred to Babylon, you remember it talked about a woman. You remember it said that? It talked about a woman. And so it is that how does God symbolize his church? 
In Jeremiah 6 and verse 2, God says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. When you think about who Zion is, God said in Isaiah 51 and verse 16, Say unto Zion, Thou art my people. So when God uses a woman symbolically in Scripture, prophetically, it often refers to a church. It refers to a church. In this case, it was His church. God even used language again that referred to a woman. Believe it or not, in the Bible, men were not referred to as virgins. When you would use the word virgin, it was, often, it was always referring to a woman. So even when God said this here in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2, God says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So again, in every way, when God would speak about his people, his church symbolically, he would refer to her not merely as a woman, but as a virgin, which would mean that it is a pure woman. Are you following that? So when God would refer to his church, he would refer to it as a pure woman. Now that we understand that, what does a harlot represent in Scripture? What does a harlot represent in Scripture? Well, the Bible says this. It says, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. This is in Ezekiel 16, verses verse 2 and 15. And again, because of the screen, you're not able to see the whole verse. If we can work on that, it'd be good, but if not, it says, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. Thou didst trust in thine own beauty and played the harlot. Don't lose that. Let's turn there. Ezekiel 16. In Ezekiel, the 16th chapter, verse 2 and verse 15. The Bible is very, very clear on this matter. In Ezekiel 16, verse 2 and verse 15, let's notice what the Bible says, okay? It says in verse 2, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. When you go down to verse 15, it says, thou didst trust in thine own beauty and played the harlot. Do you see that? So now, thank God it's on the screen as well, so if you'd like, you can look up there. It also says in Isaiah 1 and verse 21, How is the faithful city become an harlot? Well, how did that happen? It says it was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. So if we were to go ahead and take a look at that, when we try to understand what does a harlot represent in a spiritual sense, just by looking at these few principles, when we look at what a harlot represents, it represents a few things. Number one, it is a church. Because remember, a female, a woman, in prophetic language often refers to a church. But in the case of Babylon, it's very different from God's church. God's church was considered a virgin, a pure woman. A harlot is the absolute opposite. It's an impure woman, a woman who's been with many lovers. And so as a result of that, when we think about Babylon, spiritually speaking, it's a harlot. What are the lessons that we learn? Number one, it is a church that professes purity because it professes to follow God. But, number one, it is unfaithful to God and has many lovers because it's a fornicator. Okay? Number two, it practices trust in its own abilities. That's called creature merit. It determines its righteousness, not by faith, but by its works. And that was the issue that we saw in Ezekiel. It trusted in itself and played the harlot. Playing a harlot, spiritually speaking, is putting trust in self. Continuing, it says, it practices things that God calls an abomination. That's another reason why God is offended by this spiritual Babylon. is because it's unfaithful to God, has many lovers. It practices trust in its own abilities, which is very offensive to God, creature merit. It practices things that God calls an abomination. And then finally, it violates God's Ten Commandments and practices sin. The Bible makes it very clear that sin is the breaking of God's Ten Commandments. 
The question is, how many commandments do we need to break before heaven would call us a sinner? You see, in our world today, even when we do something wrong, we expect mercy. You know why? Because we often talk about the good about us. You know, we say, yes, I did do that wrong, but what about all the good that I've done over here? And God, unfortunately, doesn't have that kind of judgment, and I'm thankful for that. And so what the Lord does is he says, listen, even if we break one commandment, the Bible says something. Go to James chapter 2. Let me show you what it says. In James, the second chapter, I want you to watch what the Bible says. If we break even one commandment, what does the Bible say about that? In James, we're looking at the second chapter now, James chapter 2, and here's what the text says. In James, the second chapter, we can go ahead and look at verse 10. And in James 2, 10, here's what it says. Very, very clear, plain language. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in how many points? One point. The Bible says he's guilty of how much? He's guilty of all. Now, what law is he talking about? Verse 11. For he that said, do not commit adultery, that is the seventh commandment, said also, do not kill, that's the sixth commandment. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the whole law. So what God doesn't want us to do is waste a lot of time talking about, well, I'm not that bad, I only broke two of the commandments versus all ten. God says, actually, contrary to popular opinion, if you break one, you broke all ten. You get that? The sooner we learn that is the more humble we will be. You just can't judge a man when you know you're just as guilty as he is. You get that? That's the problem, blindsided, we get blindsided. But the point is, is that this is what God is teaching. Babylon is a harlot. Why is it a harlot? Because she has many lovers. She puts her trust in her own merits. She practices all sorts of things that the Bible calls an abomination. And she openly commits sin before God. Well, Daniel, the seventh chapter, points us to something that we cannot ignore. In Daniel, the seventh chapter, and if you don't mind, let's turn there. In Daniel 7, I want you to see what it says in Daniel 7, verses 17 and 23. It goes through symbolic language and prophetic symbolic language. And what the Bible does is it helps us understand when God is speaking symbolically what he's referring to. So in Daniel, the seventh chapter, I want you to see what it says as we consider verses 17 and then 23. In Daniel 7, we're looking at verses 17 and 23. Let's notice what the Bible says. In Daniel 7... And verse 17, the Bible says, these great beasts. Now keep in mind, God just showed Daniel in vision four beasts. He showed him a lion, and then he showed him a bear, and then he showed him a leopard, and then he showed him a beast that was so gross that God couldn't even equate it to an animal on earth. So God just called it a great and terrible beast. But he showed him four beasts. But what do these beasts represent? Verse 17. In Daniel 7 and verse 17, it says, These great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Go to verse 23. In verse 23, it says, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And so God knew that there were going to be some kingdoms that were going to rise up. Again, if we were to study history, we would know that these kingdoms were absolute fact. I mean, you know, Daniel 7 and Daniel 8, Daniel 9, Daniel 12, Daniel 11 and 12, they are some of the strongest chapters in the Bible to prove that God exists and the Bible is the authoritative word of God. I mean, they lay out our history, not just America, the world, in such a clear way that it's like, how could these writers have known this when it's hundreds of years, if not over a thousand years, before some of these things even happened? Well, here it is that the Bible makes it very clear. In these four beasts, there was a fourth beast that really caught Daniel's attention. This fourth beast was very powerful. The fourth world kingdom is presented by a horrible monster with iron teeth and ten horns. 
What do those horns represent? If you study the Bible, the Bible would tell you very clearly in Daniel 7 and verse 24. It says, and the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. And another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. Anyone who has ever studied church history knows that the first world kingdom that we're talking about was none other than Babylon. And then after that came Medo-Persia. And then after that came Greece. But after Greece came that fourth kingdom, and that was Rome. When Rome came into existence, the Bible made it very clear. Ten kings that shall arise, another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. Well, let's take a look at this. When you look at this very clearly, these are the kingdoms that made up what we call today Western Europe. All right? In Western Europe, you had the Visigoths, which today we call Spain. Then you had the Anglo-Saxons, today we would call that England. Then you would have the Franks, which we would call France. Then we would have the Alemanes, which today we would call Germany. Then we would have the Burgundians, which today we would call that Switzerland. Then we would have the Lombards, today we would call that Italy. Then we had the Suebes, which we could, would call today Portugal. But then you had these other three kingdoms called the Heralides, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. And those three were actually rooted, uprooted. Now that was exactly what the Bible prophesied in Daniel 2, as well as in Daniel 7. Three of the kingdoms would be uprooted. It said it right here. Subdue three kings. So Western Europe had these ten nations, but God knew that three would be uprooted by this one that was diverse from the rest. We need to identify who this is. In Daniel 7's prophecy, what was it that would happen next after this vision was given? Daniel says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. Now, to really get the picture of this, let's go to Daniel chapter 7. Let's turn there. When you go to Daniel 7, I want us to look especially at verses 19 to 21. When we go to Daniel 7, verses 19 to 21, let's notice something. Daniel is very, very interested in this fourth beast, and then, of course, this little horn that pops up. And here it is that the Bible now says in Daniel 7, we're considering verses 19 to 21. When you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. It says in verse 19, then I would know the truth of the fourth beast. So keep in mind, Daniel is very intrigued by this fourth beast. The other beasts have their place, but Daniel is very caught up in this fourth beast. He says, then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, who looked was more stout than his fellows. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints, and prevailed against them. Now, you can understand why Daniel was interested in that fourth beast. That fourth beast did something that the other beast, it was not... It was not written the same. This beast caught Daniel's attention, especially because of verse 21. Because in verse 21, the beast makes war against God's people. It begins to persecute God's people. It begins to tear down God's people. In fact, this beast is so arrogant that the Bible actually says what else it did in verse 25 of Daniel 7. In Daniel 7 and verse 25, take a look at what else it says. In Daniel 7 and verse 25, it says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High. So that means that this beast's power is actually not only going to fight against God, God's people, it's going to fight against God and speak great words against him. Then it says, And shall wear out the saints of the Most High. That means, again, he's going to begin killing God's people. Then after that, it not only says that, 
it says, and think to change times and laws. I really like a different translation for this one. In some of the other translations, it does not say, think to change times and laws. It actually says, think to change times and the law in the Aramaic. And so it was trying to change times, but also try to change God's law. And then what else did it say in conclusion? Think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hands until the time and times and the dividing of time. We've got to break that down. What is that talking about? We've got to break that down. So watch this. Are there clear points of identification of who this power is? This is clearly an antichrist power. It fights against God's people. It fights against God. It exalts itself. It practices abominations. It commits sins. It causes God's people to turn away from God. I mean, you're talking about a very, very, very ungodly system. So let's go ahead and let's figure it out. God gives us nine characteristics I want you to watch this. God gives us nine characteristics of the Antichrist in Daniel 7, so we can be certain of his identity. Let's go ahead and let's start going through these things point by point. Number one, the little horn or kingdom came up among them, the horn, the ten horns, which were the kingdoms of Western Europe. It says it was going to come up among them. So one thing we know about this little horn, it would be a little kingdom somewhere in Western Europe. It would have to be, because it came up among the ten kingdoms in Western Europe. It wasn't away from it, it was among it. Number two, it would have a man at its head who could speak for it. Because it talked about a man, a man in his mouth, he would speak and say various things. Number three, it would pluck up or uproot three kingdoms. That's also what the Bible said about this Antichrist power. Number four, it would be diverse or different from the other ten kingdoms. It would be something different about it. Then, number five, it would make war with and wear out or persecute the saints, God's people. Make war with, wear out, persecute the saints of God, God's people. Number six, it would emerge from the pagan Roman Empire, which was the fourth world kingdom. So remember that. It, the fourth kingdom was Rome. First you had Babylon. Our history books verify that. Then you had Medo-Persia. Then you had Greece. Then you had Rome. Then it said it would come up in the midst of them. So we know for sure that it would come from the pagan Roman Empire. Number seven, God's people, the saints, would be given into his hand for something called time times dividing of time. We have to understand what that means. Number eight, it would speak great words against or blaspheme God. In Revelation 13, 5, the Bible says the same power speaks great things and blasphemies. So literally, in Revelation 13 and in Daniel 7, we're seeing the same beast power. In fact, let me show you one quick thing in Revelation 13, just so we can clear it point very quickly. In Revelation, the 13th chapter, if you take a look, you will notice that the Bible spells out something that we would do well to consider. Remember the order that I just gave you in history? The Bible says that that first kingdom was Babylon. God likened Babylon to a lion. The second kingdom was Medo-Persia. God likened that kingdom to a bear. Then the next kingdom was Greece. God likened that kingdom to a leopard. And then the next beast was something that couldn't be properly described to another animal on earth, so it was just simply called a great and terrible beast. But we know that that next kingdom was none other than Rome. So please understand, when Daniel was given this vision, Daniel was seeing in the future. Are you following that? Daniel was living in the time of Babylon, he's living in the time of Medo-Persia, okay? But eventually would come Greece and then Rome. So Daniel's looking into the future. Now we're in Revelation 13. John the Revelator is seeing something as well. Let's notice what John sees in Revelation 13. In Revelation 13 and verse 1, John says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, 
and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, seat, and great authority. So notice, Daniel was in the time of Babylon, but he's seen in the future the bear, the leopard, and then this indescript beast, Rome. John the Revelator is living in the time of Rome. You understand that? John is living in the time of Rome. So he's living in the time of the fourth beast. So now John, as he's being given this vision about this fourth beast and its progression, he says it was like the bear and the leopard and the lion. It's reflecting it. It's like Daniel was looking into the prophetic future. John is making a connection from the prophetic past. But Daniel and John are seeing the same thing. Are you following that? All right. So when you look at Revelation 13, it says the Bible says the same power speaks great things and blasphemy. So there's no question that this fourth beast, power, and the little horn that would rise out of it, there's no question that John was seeing the same thing that Daniel saw. Now, number nine, it would think to change times and laws, or the law. Who is this beast? Well, don't forget all these identif identification points come directly from the Bible. They are not some human opinion or speculation. Historians could tell you quickly what power is being described. These points can fit only one power, and that, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, that is the papacy. And for clarity, if you don't know what the papacy is, I will say it in more plain language. The Roman Catholic Church system. That is what Daniel saw. That's what John the Revelator saw. And the real question is, do you see what they see? That's the question. There is no power that could fulfill all of these identifying marks. And I want you to understand, as we put this caution up, this is a system of worship that we're identifying, not people. Okay? Very, very important. We're dealing with a system of worship. All right? Not specific persons. There are many God-fearing, truly Christian people in the papacy or the Roman Catholic Church. Our focus is identifying the Antichrist Babylonian power system that opposes Jesus' truth and church. Now, this is where you're going to be tested. Because some of us are more loyal to a church than Jesus. I want you to think about that. Some of us are more loyal to traditions than we are loyal to Jesus. It is important for us to understand how Christ looks at that. Go to Matthew 15. In Matthew the 15th chapter, you have to understand this. This is a problem. Today, our world is filled with people that are more loyal to a church than they are to Jesus. They're more loyal to a church than they are the Bible and God's truth. This is a problem. In Matthew 15, they are more loyal to church tradition than they are to God and His truth. And what does the Bible say about that in Matthew 15? I want you to see what it says, verses 7 to 9. This is very, very serious, my brothers and sisters. In, Rev in Matthew 15, verses 7 to 9, what are the first two words in verse 7? You hypocrites. Jesus called people hypocrites. Why were they called hypocrites? It says, you hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you saying, watch this, verse 8. This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips. But what's the problem? Their heart is far from me. They say a lot with their mouths. Oh, I love God. Oh, I love you, Lord. But Jesus says, but that's only lip service because your heart is far from me. Why? Verse 9. It says in verse 9, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines, what? The commandments of men. 
We're living in a time of judgment. God is using His commandments as the test in the judgment. This is the time that you and I are to demonstrate our loyalty to God by following Him and keeping His commandments, not keeping man's commandments. And so we're living in a very serious testing time. And so when we talk about this power, what we have to understand, the greatest problem with the Roman Catholic Church system is that while it follows many things, it does not follow the Bible nor the God of the Bible. And that is a major problem that God clearly showed I needed to be talked about in my word. And so watch. How is it that the papacy fits these points? Number one, it came up among the ten kingdoms of Western Europe. The geographical location of the papal power was in Rome, Italy, the very heart of the territory of Western Europe. That's a perfect match. It came right up in the midst of it, remember that, and it today is still in Rome, Italy. That is exactly where it is. Number two, it would have a man at its head who speaks for it. The papacy meets this identifying mark because it does have one man at the head, and that's called the Pope. The Pope gets the last say. No one is allowed to contradict the Pope. That is a major problem because the Pope is just as much human as you and me. And as we can make mistakes and sins, so can the Pope. But in Roman Catholicism, it is taught, no, the Pope has a superior position than the rest of us. That's not what the Bible teaches. Go to Matthew 23. If you look at Matthew, the 23rd chapter, look at what the Bible teaches. Jesus wanted to make this thing ever so clear that nobody would miss it. In Matthew, the 23rd chapter, I want you to see what the Bible says because Jesus knew that this would be a problem. And so look at what Jesus said here as he would refer to individuals that would want to be called certain things but were not worthy to be called so. And so the Bible says in Matthew chapter 23, and we can go ahead and start at verse 3. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, for they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Watch verse 8 now. But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ. And then how does the verse close? And all you are brethren. He then says in verse 9, now, another name for the Pope today is called Holy Father. There's nobody else that's called that in churches, even though there are names that people have in churches that they shouldn't have, like Reverend. Reverend, the Bible says in Psalm 111 and verse 9, Holy and Reverend is God's name. No man should call himself Reverend. No woman should call herself Reverend. But how much the more, in verse 9, in a spiritual sense, it says, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Jesus was not referring to biological daddies. He was talking about, in a spiritual sense, do not call any man father. But that's the very name for the Pope's holy father. And so it is that they try to make this prerogative about themselves to put themselves at a higher place than everybody else. But the truth of the matter is, is that no, they are to be the greatest of servants. They are to be the greatest of servants. Do you know every pastor of a church is the greatest of servants? I've met pastors that say, nope, the buck stops here. What I say, it's my way or the highway. What I say goes and what everybody else thinks doesn't matter. Those are blind ministers. Did you hear what I just said? Those are blind ministers. They can't see straight. A minister knows that he is not the final voice. There's nothing in the Bible that says that. We are the chief of servants. 
We are to hold the people to the standard of God, but there's no authority in me as a pastor. There's no authority in me. The only authority is the word of God, and the only thing a pastor stands on is the word of God. That's it. And you don't vote on the word of God. But today, many religious leaders don't understand you are called to be the greatest of servants. The higher you are, the lower you reach to serve. Amen. That's a real pastor. That's a real minister. The higher I am, the lower I reach to serve. But unfortunately, today we have many people, and again, the Pope himself, he's the head. He speaks for the church, and no man may say unto him nay. Well, here it is. It would pluck up or uproot three kingdoms. The emperors of Western Europe were largely Catholic and supported the papacy in growth and authority. Three Aryan kingdoms, however, did not support the papacy. The Vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrogoths. So the Catholic emperors decided they must be subdued or destroyed. It is not difficult to recognize that the papacy fits this point. And so it is what we're looking at as we're watching that we're watching the match come together. And if, you know, if you are Roman Catholic, if you're not careful, you're going to be offended by this. You're going to be offended by this. But do you know one thing that God teaches us is that, listen, God never teaches truth to offend us. That's not, that's not what his purpose of presenting truth is. The purpose of truth is in John 8 and verse 32. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Unfortunately, there are powers that are out there that are deceiving us. And some of us are determined, I am going to follow that deceptive power no matter what. Well, God loves us enough to give us the freedom to even be uh, wrong, to make a bad decision, to even be lost. It's one of the hardest things that I can only imagine that God goes through. I'm the father of four children. Can you imagine your son or your daughter saying, I choose to be lost? And you know the ramifications of that. You know the impact of a statement like that. And so I can only imagine, I, I, I've asked God that many a times in my prayer life, Lord, how do you do it? How do you watch your children make decisions where you know what it leads to in the end? But I'm thankful that God is a, is a God of major forbearance, very patient, always reaching out and seeking to help and to lift back up. Amen. We'll bring up some final points here. It would be diverse or different from the other kingdoms. The papacy clearly fits this description also. It came on the scene as a religious power, not a political one. It didn't come out as a political power like pagan Rome, but it came also out as a religious power and was totally different from the secular nature of the Ten Kingdoms. Again, it would make war with and persecute the saints of God. You know, if you look at church history, and again, I remember going through this, the Dark Ages, so many people lost their lives simply because they refused to believe, to follow, and to practice like what the Church of Rome taught. You know, the Church of Rome would say this little disc right here that we use for communion. They would say this represents the literal body of Christ. The other Christians believe, no, 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 it's a symbol of Christ. It's not the actual body, but it was taught in Rome, no, this is the actual body of Christ. And if you don't believe that, you know what they would do to people that didn't believe that? They would burn them at a stake. I mean, can you imagine people would lose their lives because they refused to believe that a, a bread did not represent the literal body of Christ, but was only symbolic of it. And so it is that the papacy was known for killing thousands and thousands of people, tens of thousands of people. And as a result of that, if you remember in the year 2000, you probably don't remember it, but in the year 2000, I don't know if you remember, March 13, year 2000, the New York Times it was Pope John Paul II that he himself acknowledged the atrocities of Rome in the past. Pope John Paul II said this, he asked for forgiveness for the errors of the church. And what he said is, we humbly ask forgiveness. Today delivered the most sweeping papal apology ever, repenting for the errors of his church over the last 2,000 years. 
We cannot not recognize the betrayal of the gospel committed by some of our brothers, especially in the second millennium. The Pope dressed in purple robes for Lent said in his homily, recognizing the deviations of the past serves to reawaken our consciences to the compromises of the present. And so even the papacy themselves made a public apology saying, we are sorry for all the murders that we have committed. But what's unfortunate is that when you read their doctrines, they still believe that sometimes it's necessary to kill a heretic. And so the problem is that while the apology went out, the doctrine didn't change. And Pope John Paul II is gone. And there's a whole different pope in place now. And so what one pope believed in the past does not mean that the pope today won't practice. And so it is that it would emerge from the fourth kingdom of iron, pagan Rome. The mighty Catholic Church was little more than the Roman Empire baptized. The very capital of the old Roman Empire became the capital of the Christian Empire. The office of Pontifex Maximus was continued in that of the Pope. And so over and over and over again, there are many teachings showing that the papacy is a perfect fit for this Antichrist power. It says, whatever Roman elements the barbarians and Arians left came under the protection of the Bishop of Rome, who was the chief person there after the Emperor's disappearance. The Roman Church in this way privately pushed itself into the place of the Roman world empire, of which it is the actual continuation. So literally, the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church, is simply a continuation of pagan Rome, the fourth beast power. This is the power that is Antichrist. This is the power that is vehemently against God. And you know, I have a, I have a Roman Catholic relative myself, my mother-in-law. My wife is Haitian by descent. And like in many Hispanic culture, in Haitian culture, Roman Catholicism is the culture. It's the religion. It is the top religion. And I've done these series, and I've done it in many places. And you always have two groups. You have some people that say, I am born Catholic. I'm going to die Catholic, no matter what the Bible or any man says. There are some people that just kind of have that attitude, okay? I know from a biblical perspective, unfortunately, that is an attitude of death, not an attitude of life. You should never be more loyal to a religion or a denomination. The reasons why the Bible says the gospel sometimes must be preached for a witness. It doesn't mean everybody will accept. Pray for them. You pray for our sons, our daughters, our mothers, our fathers, our brothers, our sisters. You pray where Rome is seeking to regain the power that it lost. And you and I need to have our eyes open to know where we stand with the Lord. Let's bring out this closing point here. God's people, the saints, would be given into his hands for times, times, and the dividing of times. There's so much that needs clarification with this. I'm going to bring this final point out. We'll pick back up on this our next time. Hey, I have a question. Um, I've been wrestling with this, and... I really want to be able to cover this with you all. I knew that it might be a bit challenging to cover it all tonight because there's so much detail in it. And again, I don't like finishing a presentation just to say, well, I finished it, but you don't leave with understanding. That doesn't do me any good. And so um, I wanted to do a part two to this. But I have other things that I need to share with you all because this is my last week being privileged to be your servant. And so because of that, I, I really wanted to, and it's, it's kind of like on the spot, so you kind of let me know, you know, if we need to talk about it. But I actually, tomorrow night, we were supposed to be off. Monday night. Monday night, we were supposed to be off, and then come back Tuesday, and then you'd be off on Wednesday, and then we'd come back Thursday and Friday. That was the original plan. But I wanted to know, both from leadership and then also from yourselves, if we could come back to finish this study tomorrow night. So what I wanted to know first from leadership is if that's something that we, you think we'd be flexible with. Well, praise the Lord for that. And now what I want to know is I want to ask you all, I want you to get the rest of this. And guess what? Far more than me, God wants you to get the rest of this. It's very, very important that we understand these last movements 
of this system called Babylon. And it's so deep. And it involves you and I because it's a lasting issue. And so my question to you is, is can you make it back tomorrow night as well so we can cover some more of this and be able to go through it? Is that something you think you can do? Amen? Praise the Lord. All right, good. Well, then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to just pause right here. Tonight, we've identified many steps. I am a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am a man that has learned to love God and to love his people. And what I've realized about love is when you really love somebody, you don't just tell them what they want to hear. You have to also tell them time and again what they need to hear. I know for a fact that we cannot have all that's written in the Bible about Babylon. You saw it, brothers and sisters. You saw it. I mean, for us to turn a blind eye to it will not take away a single truth. You saw for yourselves how offensive Babylon is to God. And I can only imagine what it feels like when the church you hold dear and near to your heart is being identified as an anti-Christ power. I, I can only imagine what that feels like, okay? I used to be Pentecostal, and I discovered some things about the practice of Pentecostalism in my life that I realized was offensive to God. I didn't know it at the time. I believed in speaking in tongues. I believed in doing all sorts of things. I thought I was honoring God. But when I came in contact with the Bible, I had to make a decision. Okay, who do I follow now? I see what the Bible says. Who do I follow? And you remember, I told you my story when I learned about the Sabbath. I had to decide, who am I going to follow? There is no Sabbath keeping in the Bible for Sunday. It's all Friday sunset to Saturday sunset. And I had to make a decision. I look back 27 years, man, I'm so thankful I made that decision. I mean, I am grateful to God that I've chosen to follow Him and His Word and not any man. Amen. And I've learned that even when I break away from a church, it does not mean that I have to be mean to those people. I don't have to look down at them. I don't have to do any of those things. And so what I'm sharing with you is that I understand that this is sensitive. I just want you to understand. I understand to go through teachings like this is super sensitive. We're in a world today where Christian churches are compromising. They're, they're calling everything right and hardly anything wrong. That's not what the Bible teaches. And so I realize the ministers of the last days, we're going to need some strength and courage. Because it's not easy to stand for truth. Not these days. And it's going to get worse because the laws of the lands are on the side of the rebels. And so that means that a day is coming very soon where you preach the truth. People can walk in and literally put you in cuffs and walk you out. And those days are getting a whole lot closer. But God already told us these days will come. And our love for Christ constrains us. Amen. We cannot remain silent. We cannot hold our peace to obtain the favor of any. And so I'm not apologetic for what I'm sharing, but I'm also sympathetic for what's happening in the hearts of some of us when you see teachings like this. I want to encourage you to pray. I want you to make your own decision. Just understand whatever decision you make is going to be an eternal one. If you choose to follow a tradition and a religion and a denomination above the clear teachings of the Word of God, you are rejecting God. And God says in Hosea 4, 6, because you've rejected me, I will reject you. And that's serious. And so I want you to be prayerful, ever so prayerful. Who are you going to follow? Who are you going to follow? And so my appeal is this. I've already made my decision. In the midst of my trials, in the midst of my battles, I've made up my mind. I want to encourage you to make up yours. If you have chosen to follow God, to follow what His Word says, above tradition, denomination, religion, or any of these other things, I want to invite you to stand to your feet. If you're choosing to follow God and His Word above the traditions, above the religions, above the denominations, I'm going to do what 
God says. I'm going to follow his word. And that's why you're standing. You're going to realize, and I, I, I hope my appeal is clear. If you in your mind are saying, I will follow God's word, I will follow God's truth above tradition, religion, any other denomination, I'm following God's word. I'm inviting you to stand to your feet. And as you stand, I want you to know that Jesus stands with you. He will help you and he will encourage you. And you might say, I'm standing because I believe God's word and I believe God's word does not point out the papacy as the Antichrist. Well, let's say you believe that. What I would recommend is, let's study it. Let's study to show ourselves approved unto God. Let's look at all the evidence. Let's weigh it. And let's see what God says. My hope and my prayer is you will stand upon God's word and his promises at last. Amen. Let us pray. Our loving Father, we do thank you. We thank you so much, Lord, for your wonderful words of life. Father, my heart is compassionate to the challenges that some of us are facing in this room. Because some of us hold Roman Catholicism in a very high place in our hearts. But Lord, I pray that Roman Catholicism would be put down and Jesus would be lifted up on that very seat of our hearts. For he always belonged there. And I pray that we will be willing and teachable to accept your word just as it is written in prophecy. And I pray that you might bring us to a precious place that as a result of our faithfulness and our loyalty to you, that you will put us on sure ground. Bless us to this end, we pray. Be with my brothers and sisters as they depart from this place, but never your presence. We humbly ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you so much for your loving kindness towards me by allowing us to have another night. So that means tomorrow evening we will come back together at 7 p.m. And we will look forward to seeing you all as we continue from where we left off to go over Mystery Babylon the Great. We will have our singers come before us at this time to prepare to usher us out. God bless you and have a good night.